Today's scripture reading is from the book of Colossians in the New Testament, chapter 3, verses 1 to 4, and verses 12 through 17. Since then, you have been raised with Christ. Set your hearts on things above, where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. For you died, and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with each other and forgive one another if any of you has a grievance against someone. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. And over all these virtues put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, since as members of one body you were called to peace. And be thankful. Let the message of Christ dwell among you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom through psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit, singing to God with gratitude in your hearts. And whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. This is God's word. So one of the things they teach you when you go to train to be a preacher is the importance of hooking your listener early on, uh, engaging them on the relevance of the topic and piquing curiosity quickly. Otherwise, they'll you know, fly away and channel surf into other areas, even though they're sitting there and watching you and shaking their head. Sometimes that's a real challenge. Other times the subject matter does the work for you as the case today, because we're talking about the intersection of faith and politics. Oh my gosh, has Leo lost it? He really does need a sabbatical. Well, that's entirely possible that, that I've lost it and this is a crazy idea. But on the other hand, uh, I think it's really something important that we talk about. We don't talk about it much. If you've been at City Church any length of time, you know this is not something we talk about a lot. I'm, I remember when I was growing up hearing people say respectable people, there's two things respectable people don't talk about in public. It's religion and politics. And I have the audacity to talk about both this morning. Now, we're in a post-Easter brief series looking at the ramifications of the resurrection. Easter, we're saying, is not just a holiday, it's a doorway into an entirely different realm of existence. That re existence has the capacity to change everything, to even renew something as incendiary as politics. What we're doing is taking one passage, Colossians chapter three, and we're holding it up and looking at it from different angles, at different ways in which what Paul was saying, the resurrection in this new realm can renew everything. And if it can renew everything, it can even renew politics, even in our day where it's become so polarizing and poisonous. So what do we glean from this ancient text to help us make some sense of our modern politics? I think there's three big takeaways. First of all, that we need a reimagined framework. Secondly, we need a refreshing tone. And finally, a renewing message. All right, so let's look at those three. First of all, a reimagined framework. A Christian is someone who not only identifies with Jesus Christ, but who is going about the massive overhaul work of reconstructing their entire life based on the teaching of Jesus. That's what we call discipleship, which Clint was talking about earlier. And I think you, you see this early on in uh, the New Testament with one of the most famous first century unbelievers, a guy named Saul of Tarsus. He not only was uninterested in identifing with Christianity, he saw it as dangerous, as frankly a lot of people do today. So much so that he was a leader of a movement to extinguish early Christianity. And he was well on his way until 
something happened he didn't expect. He met the resurrected Jesus Christ. He just appeared, he erupted right there in his life and that changed everything. What he thought was real proved not to be the case and what he was convinced was a hope turned out to be real. And his entire life turned over. What you see with Paul then is that he goes through a process. He actually has to get away for a while to do this, to deconstruct his thought process and his metaphysical framework, and then take it all the way down to the foundation, then begin to reconstruct his life and develop a new framework. And you get a real sense as to what that framework was from this passage in Colossians chapter three, from the way that it begins and the way that it concludes. So let's focus on those two first, the way that it begins. Since then, you have been raised with Christ. So there you see the resurrection. Set your hearts on things above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. So he's saying, he, let's, let's tease out the ramifications of the resurrection of Jesus, but don't miss, he's not just saying Jesus was raised somehow, mysteriously, if you belong to him through faith, then you are united to him. And therefore, when he was raised, there's a sense in which you were raised as well and ushered into this new realm. What is that new realm? It's the place where Jesus is, seated at the right hand of God. That is a, an early metaphor for a place of supreme authority. So, you know, when disciples James and John had uh, selfish ambitions about this next realm of existence, they came up to Jesus and said, hey, Jesus, when, when you get into your place, can we sit at your right and left in glory? And he's like, you don't have a clue what you're asking for. And they didn't. But they wanted to be right there, part and parcel with his decision-making authority. That's Jesus' place. He occupies supreme authority over all the world. And as new people ushered into this new realm of existence, we are to be, if you describe yourself as a Christian, people who are curating a heart full of new passions. And we do that by setting our heart in this realm. A new set of allegiances and loyalties and loves directed at this one who is at the right hand in heaven. So that's how the passage begins. Think now just for a second about how it concludes. Paul says, whatever you do, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus. We talked about the significance last week of name, but think about Lord Jesus. Scholars, New Testament scholars like N.T. Wright have talked a good bit about how subversive was that language was in the first century. It was theologically subversive, but it was also politically subversive. Why? Because this is the day of the Roman emperor. <laughs> Paul is in prison for goodness sake for affirming that Jesus, rather than Caesar, and the Caesar at this point was Nero, who was, that just meant bad things if you were a Christian. Caesar, Jesus, rather than Caesar, was Lord. And see, there was an early history. The, the first emperor, Caesar Augustus, was uh, not only so popular, but he wanted to enforce that popularity in a powerful way. And so he began to require that people address him as Lord, to bow down to him. Eventually that took on additional meaning to consider him savior. He was to be called savior. And then once he died, after he died, he had an additional title, essentially God. And so by the time you get to Nero, all of that is baked in to that. It's code Lord Jesus for Jesus rather than Caesar is the ultimate allegiance and loyalty, the ultimate savior, the true savior and God. And uh, so... How should this help us reimagine a framework 
if you would describe yourself as a Christian, that really helps to renew politics? Uh, there's several things, so let me just run through these. The first is, we, we've, it, the key is right up here. Again, it's a good follow-up to the segment on Space City Fellows, but it's really taking seriously the life of the mind. He says, set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. He'd already said, set your hearts on things above, but there's one way to access the heart and it's through the mind. It is the gateway to the person's interior being. You want to set your heart's affections and loyalties in a new place, develop and curate new passions, it's through the life of the mind. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. So we need to train ourselves, putting it differently, to read our Bible first, to read our Bible into our politics, not our politics into our Bible. And I think that when we do that, to the degree that we do that, shouldn't it lead to more of a nuanced approach to policy, public policy and politics? And, and it makes me wonder if it's even possible if someone is actually doing that, and it's crazy difficult, of course. It makes me wonder if it's even possible to adopt carte blanche, the political platform of any party. Okay, moving on to even more controversial things. Through realigning our hearts to our deepest love and highest loyalty, meaning Jesus as the Supreme Lord, as our King, there's a number of things that that means. It means that because we are raised, because we are citizens first, if you're a Christian, of the kingdom of God, that that's where our deepest loyalties are to be, not to our country. Do we pledge allegiance to the flag? Sure, of course. But that is not our ultimate highest loyalty. Our loyalty can't ultimately be to a political party affiliation, to a candidate, to an office holder, or even, hold on, to a conspiracy theory but to the Lord of Lords. And so I think it means that we need to do periodic passion checks, each of us. What, it's not just saying, what am I really passionate about, but it's, it's the, the weights and measures of passions in us. Am I more or less passionate about politics, about a political movement, about a candidate or office holder than I am about the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords? And it shouldn't be, you know, one way one week and the other way the next week. It would be so offsetting and disproportionate, our love and loyalty to the king, that the other pales by comparison. I think one way of getting at that is just doing a little audit of our conversations in a particular day or week. What do I talk about the most? What am I thinking about the most? I think it also calls into question whether or not it's even possible on a blue, red, liberal, conservative continuum to identify Jesus Christ? Or is his realm a completely different one altogether? Is he on a different plane altogether? That Jesus, of course, was not a Republican or a Democrat, that he said to Pilate, the politician, the Roman politician, when he was accusing him shortly before his death sentence, Jesus said, my kingdom is not of this world. So I think what that means is, because what Jesus didn't mean by that is that Christians should just be apathetic and uninterested about public policy and politics. What it means is though, I think, his church should be a kind of third space, uh, operating in a different orbit from the binary world of modern American politics. It also means that equally devoted, thoughtful, earnest Christians can and will arrive at sometimes very different conclusions, politically speaking, and that that shouldn't be a referendum on that person's faith just because they express different views from you. 
So you might hear this so far and you're just like, oh, it's just so toxic and difficult. I just, can't we just know, you know, can't we just not deal with politics? And so I, one of our staff members who's got a background in literature actually reminded me this week that the word politics comes from Aristotle and actually means the affairs of the city. So if politics means being concerned about the affairs of the city, there's no sense in which a Christian should be apolitical. Because, I mean, just think back in our recent history, we talked about Jonah in early in this year. And Jonah is the story of the guy who ran away from God because he wasn't concerned about the great city of Nineveh, this city that he viewed as, you know, irreligious and morally reckless, oppressive of God's people. But God said, no, you've got to go because I am deeply concerned about it. If God's concerned about the welfare and affairs of the city, we should be as well. And that's just one example. I mean, you look early in the Bible at Joseph, who was first enslaved, but then rose up and was recognized and, and basically ended up at the right hand of Pharaoh, the king of Egypt. Another example, later in the Bible, in the Old Testament, Daniel, similarly taken against his will into exile, arch enemy of Israel, Babylon. But here's Daniel lifted up into a place of extraordinary authority. Both Daniel and Joseph served with great dignity and respect for the governing authorities that they were under, but also recognized those weren't their ultimate authorities. And another example is Queen Esther in Persia, who under extraordinary pressure and remarkable courage put her neck on the line for her people, Israel, in a place as hostile as Persia at that point in time. Because all three of them, and so many other examples, their ultimate allegiance and loyalty was to the king of kings. And it makes me think of a little snippet from this passage in Colossians <clears throat> that I don't want you to miss because I think in some way it distills where we need to be in terms of a framework. He says, when Christ, who is your life, appears, you too will appear with him in glory. Christ, who is your life. Not Christ, who is your hobby. We don't dabble in Jesus. He is our passion. He is our priority. And one of the most practical ways that we can do that to show that he is our priority is to keep that connection line of prayer open with him. You say, well, what? it feels so overwhelming, the political situation. What am I to do? We are instructed in the Bible to pray for the governing authorities of our country and of the world. And uh, boy, the, the, uh, the preacher and publisher D.L. Moody said this, and it's very convicting to me because I know he was a much better prayer than I am. He said, when I get to heaven, next to the wonder of seeing my Savior will be, I think, the wonder that I made so little use of the power of prayer. Okay, that's way too convicting, so let's move on to the next point. So that's the first point, is reimagined framework. The, the, the second thing that we need is a refreshing tone. Can I hear an amen to that? We don't do that too many times here at City Church. Politics, as they, as they say, is a dirty game. It has become a bloody game in our country, I think, today. Sadly, oftentimes, with Christians leading the way, the vitriol, rage, condescension, and shame, it's worse than I've ever seen in my life. And I've always been one of those people that does kind of dabble in politics. I'm a little bit of a political junkie, truth be told. Uh, journalist Lisa Selen Davis, who by the way, has written for both conservative and liberal media, said this uh, just recently, I think it's pretty poignant. Unfollow if you disagree. It may sound like an innocuous social media phrase, but in reality it reflects the brokenness of a world in which divergent viewpoints preclude relationships. 
You feel that way? Ditching people or doxing, which I had not heard that term before, threatening or shaming them for their political beliefs is not only acceptable, it's the ultimate virtue signaling. And I think in our, uh, in our day, exacerbated by modern social dynamics, it's so easy to live, isn't it, in kind of a siloed, protected existence, surrounding ourselves with people that only agree with us. And so we exist in these echo chambers where people are just reinforcing what we already believe. Positions that we deem as righteous, and of course those who don't agree with us, we villainize, and it becomes this zero-sum game of righteous winners, us included, and evil losers on the other side. So when I talk about renewing politics, I mean not only reimagining a framework of truth to help us think, but maybe even more so about the tone with which Christians carry themselves. In Paul's words, there's a toxic tone to avoid and a refreshing one to embrace. He says, in terms of the toxic tone to avoid, now you must also rid yourselves of all such things as these, anger, rage, malice, slander, and filthy language from your lips. Instead of trying to take down other people who don't agree with our positions politically and otherwise, what if we actually directed our energies spiritually to taking down those kinds of toxic emotions that have a way of controlling us and instead saw every day as an opportunity to put on, as Paul said, the fresh clothing of those who have been raised with Christ. That's really the idea here. He's saying, it's, it's imagining that because you're a new person, it's kind of vivid language, you wake up each morning without any clothes on. And it's sort of a choice as to which clothes you're going to wear that day. He says, we've gotta be intentional. Just like you have to be intentional every day, putting on clothes, or you're going to seriously embarrass yourself when you walk out of your place. The question is, which clothes? It's a discipline. And he says, those clothes that we should put on are clothing yourself with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. And he goes on and says, and over all these virtues, as though it's sort of this, uh, this outer coat that you wear in a cold day, over all these virtues, put on love, which binds them together in perfect unity. Sounds great, right? Why in the world is it so stinking difficult actually to do this? When you find yourself caught in one of those conversations that just blindsides you, when you see a post that someone just blasted up on social media and you take it, as an insult, controlling those motions in that moment are incredibly difficult. Why is it difficult? I think it's because it's not dealing merely with dysregulated emotions, but with a deep underlying loyalty of our hearts. So when Paul is talking about dealing with these things, he doesn't just talk about managing our emotions. He says, put to death. The ancient language the Puritans really loved to talk about was mortify the flesh. Kill it, take it seriously, put those ugly, foul emotions to death. And how does he lay out that list of ugly emotions? We talked about a number of them already, but he gets to the end and he says this, put to death, therefore, idolatry. Now, I actually heard someone this week say, why, why are we today in modern America talking about idols. I mean, I'm not living in some undereducated, developing place in the world where people still bow down to wooden carvings. Okay, that's not what Paul is talking about. He's talking about what controls our emotions. See, what we really need to do is go beneath those emotions to what controls them, to like go out in the desert and you see a rock and you if, if, if those emotions are a rock, what we have to do is peel back the rock and then you see all the worms underneath. Those are the idols that need to be dealt with 
in our life. Because what we learn in the Bible consistently as followers of Jesus is that if we truly have made Jesus our God rather than a substitute God, an idol, then we're gonna treat people the way Jesus did. And he treated them with compassion, kindness, gentleness, and humility. And therefore, what really controls us will show up in how we treat people. Anne Lamott put it this way, you can safely assume that you've created God in your own image when it turns out that God hates all the same people that you do. So what are some practical do's and don'ts before we move on that'll foster this refreshing tone in us? First, let's make radical love rather than being right our top priority. Why is it so important to win on that particular issue that's gnawing at you in terms of policy or politics? Is that desire to win and be right on that issue actually robbing you of the incredible privilege of being God's conduit of love in other people's lives? What if instead of weaponizing social media to put other people down and make ourselves feel right, we actually used it as a medium to serve people? I had a discussion this week that I can't stop thinking about. I talked to someone who does not go to this church who told me when they found out where I pastored, they said, oh, one of you, and I know which one you are, said one word on Facebook and that one word brought this person apparently to faith in Christ. I've never heard something like that before. But it made me think about this notion that, it, that when we feel the impulse to blast something on Facebook or Twitter, are we robbing ourselves of that kind of eternal privilege and joy of being God's conduit of redemptive love into people's lives? Second, practical to do. Let's never, can we just decide never to assume that someone shares our political views. Uh, and then when they reveal that they actually may not, that we decide at that moment, without equivocation, to show them unqualified respect, appreciating that even though it doesn't make sense to you perhaps, that their faith has worked itself out in a different way than it has in your life. What it means is that we want to be a people at City Church, I think, who extend extraordinary empathy to people on these sorts of issues. It means that we are going to be exceptional at the art of listening rather than speaking, and I'm the worst violator because this is what I do for a job. It means that we actually want to be learning agile. And then thirdly, finally, before we move on to the last point, is let's see it as a strength, not a weakness, to have friends who are at different places on the political spectrum than we are, who don't think exactly like. Even more, that we see it as a strength rather than a weakness to be part of a church where everyone isn't a robot parroting the same lines, thinking the same way on these sort of issues, that it's actually a healthy thing. And boy, it's one of the strengths, I think, of being an urban church in a major metropolitan area. Because of course, people don't think exactly the same way. And maybe that's a healthy thing that helps us move out of our echo chambered silo existence and to learn from one another in life. So that's a reimagined framework, a refreshing tone, and finally, a renewing message. You know, these ideas that we're talking about, I have a feeling at this point, to some of you, they're really appealing. To others of you, they're, they're really appalling. <laughs> and yet, they'll remain simply in the theoretical realm unless we have some external force that's going to actually work it into our lives. 
the director of the Public Theology Project at Christianity Today, Russell Moore, just two weeks ago wrote this, culture wars and outrage cycles might fuel ratings and clicks and fundraising appeals, but they cannot reconcile sinners to a holy God. They cannot reunite a fragmented people. They cannot even make us less afraid in the long run. The messages of politics aren't going to renew us, in other words. They're, they're neither powerful enough nor otherworldly enough. This is where we need that message from the one who said, my kingdom is ultimately not of this world. We need that alien truth, the message of Christ that Paul talked about in Colossians. It's the other, or one of the other great 316s. You have John 316, Colossians 316 is a great one if you are looking for a verse to memorize. Let the message of Christ dwell among you richly. Now think about that for a second. Dwell among you richly. This isn't like, you know, you're scrolling through Twitter and you just see a message and you just catch a glimpse of your eye. Process it later. This isn't like the neighbor that you kind of nervously wave at going in and out of your driveway occasionally. This is, this is someone who's come in and living among you and in a sense taking over your dwelling. And it assumes the language here that we see ourselves the way Jesus opened the Sermon on the Mount as those who are poor of spirit because then we're in a desperate place as bankrupt individuals of needing his resources to enrich our lives. The resources of the gospel working deeply in us, that's what begins to renew us. And what's that message? That the Lord of heaven and earth, who had been clothed in unimaginable, infinite glory and beauty, shed himself of that, allowed himself to be violently rejected by both the religious and political leadership of the day. And both were complicit in his final execution. And as Jesus was hanging on the cross of Calvary, stripped of his clothes, he bore our judgment so that you and I might be clothed unto eternity in his everlasting goodness and grace. How does that message living in us begin to renew us. It'll give us resources to respect. It'll give us, give, us, give us forgiveness to forgive. And it'll give us the peace to be instruments of peace. Very quickly, resources to respect. We can show dignity and respect to people, even if you're not a believer. Because what the Bible says at the very beginning is every human being, we're all the same. Our, our unity is much greater than anything that divides us because we're created in God's image. And because we're created in God's image, that means we're infused, every human being you see, with massive dignity that calls us to respect. But we're all dysfunctional and broken in doing so. So we need that external message to help us <clears throat> Paul draws on this in verse 10, put on the new self, the new clothing, which is being renewed in knowledge in the image of its creator. Secondly, it'll give us forgiveness to forgive. You know, you, it's when we feel injured, right? By something someone has said to us or about a value politically that we might ascribe to. We feel injured, we feel misunderstood, maybe you have felt othered and judged. And it's natural then to retreat from people to, as a form of self-protection. But what the gospel does is it says, it, no, forgive as the Lord forgave you. How has he forgiven us? He didn't forgive us when we cleaned up our life and made ourselves forgivable. He left heaven and at ultimate expense, he pursued us and forgave us as we are. That kind of forgiveness gives us that alien power to forgive others, to pursue them. It's only the gospel that can humble us enough to be empathetic and generous. Tim Keller in a New York Times article on 
the two-party system said this, the gospel gives us the resources to love people who reject both our beliefs and personally, and us personally. Christians should think of how God rescued them. He did it not by taking power, but by coming to earth, losing glory and power, serving and dying on a cross. How did Jesus save? Not with a sword, but with nails in his hands. And then finally, he gives us the peace to be instruments of peace. How do we kill those evil impulses in us like rage, anger, and judgment? It's getting behind them and killing the idols that are there. The idol, for instance, of fear. I wonder how much fear drives so much of our problems in politics. But if I know that Jesus is Lord and Savior, that eases my angst. I don't have to be right. Everything doesn't have to be okay because his peace settles me. Paul said, let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts. Since as members of one body, you were called to peace. Every one of us at City Church is called to pursue peace with one another. The only way we can do that, particularly in the volatile world of politics, is when we live out of the resources of Christ's peace toward us. You know, this is obviously just an overwhelming subject and it, and it can leave you kind of feeling like the dysfunction is too great to overcome. But let's not forget that Jesus has been raised, we've been raised with him, and we've entered into this new realm, even though we continue to live in this one. And that he is the Lord, God, and Savior over all. And when we begin to frame our minds and fuel our hearts with the wonder of these things, I think what we'll find is that he, rather than politics or anything else, is our deepest love, our highest loyalty, and frankly, our entire life. Let's pray. Oh Lord, I need you to do the work of taking these very difficult truths, my thoughts on those truths, and using them in ways that will bring the peace of Christ to rule in our hearts and in this body. So that we leave here in our daily life as those kinds of people who others find really refreshing that we don't weaponize our opinions and our words, but we see them as a gift to be your vehicles of love, maybe even ultimate redemptive love in others' lives. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.